All right. Thank you for bearing with me for a moment. Had to work a little bit of magic up here. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. It is an honor and a pleasure and so very exciting to be here this afternoon as a daughter of this fine institution. It is always, always, always good to be home at the Mecca. Um, it's, it's also serendipitous for me. I got my start in the archives here at Mona and Spingarn. So it's good to be back. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Each time we conjure the archive, we are remembering. We are embracing times past, cultivating memory, honoring our ancestors and paving the way for those not yet born. We are, in a way, creating a form of collage, one that is carefully curated and crafted, composed of our pain, our love, our burdens, beauty, grief, and joy. The archive of today reflects these characteristics and draws upon the aesthetics of past eras. Harlem Renaissance poet, playwright, novelist, Langston Hughes, references 1920s Harlem as a time when the Negro was in vogue. A time when one could visit notable Harlem haunts such as the Cotton Club, Lenox Lounge, or the ritzy parties of Harlem socialites such as Alayla Walker, the daughter of black hair icon, Madam C.J. Walker. I'd like to extend our brother Langston's framing to include one of Harlem's most important cultural landmarks, institutions, and archives, the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library, the Division of Negro Literature, History, and Prints, the forerunner of today's Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. Opening in 1925 as a special collection, the library was created to meet the needs of a changing community, and might I add, a continually changing, gentrifying uh, neighborhood. Um, the division first won international acclaim in 1926, when the personal collection of the distinguished Afro-Latino scholar and bibliophile Arturo Alfonso Schomburg was added. Schomburg's acquired collection included more than 5,000 books, 3,000 manuscripts, 2,000 etchings and paintings, and several thousand pamphlets. Schomburg served as curator of the division from 1932 until his death in 1938. In 1940, the division was renamed the Schomburg Center Collection of Negro Literature, History, and Prints in honor of its founder. The institution became home, the workplace home, excuse me, intellectual home of esteemed librarians and curators such as Nella Larson, Regina Andrews, Lawrence D. Reddick, Catherine Ann Latimer, Roberta Bosley, and later, Jean Michael Hudson. The work of these pioneering librarians, archivists, curators, and our current staff employ what art historian Robert Ferris Thompson calls an aesthetic of cool. To quote from his pivotal uh, fall 1973 African Art Journal article, RFT states, I have come to learn the term, um, the, I'm sorry, I have come to term the attitude and aesthetic of cool and sense of deeply and complexly motivated, consciously artistic, interweaving of elements serious and pleasurable of the responsibility and of play. This aesthetic of cool, drawing upon the seriousness and pleasurable experience of black culture is what our curators keep in mind as they do the long work of collecting our past, our present, and our future. By drawing upon traditional and non-traditional black radical archival practices of memory and meaning making uh, through creativity, the jazz aesthetic, namely improvisation, and theoretical practice of artists um, such as Louis Armstrong, we as archivists, curators, and librarians reimagine the archive. We conjure memories of our past, cross spatial and temporal bounds of the African diaspora, and engage key figures as we look forward to the future of art collecting for black culture. I would argue that this cool was passed down from our namesake, our namesake Arturo Schomburg, a debonair Afro-Latino whose friends, who was friends with everyone in Harlem from John Edward Bruce to Claude McKay and painter, illustrator, and visual arts educator, Aaron Douglas. Douglas, whose murals are viewable to researchers in our main reading room, in addition to his craft, was a quintessential love letter writer. Pinning love letters to his wife, Alta Sawyer Douglas, while living in separate cities, his letters housed at the center give researchers an intimate view of an otherwise reserved artist. In 2016, with the permission of his estate, I shared one of Douglas's Harlem Renaissance era love letters in my podcast series, Life in the Reading Room Correspondence. This series aims to share interesting and engaging letters written by or to key figures from the African diaspora. 
Each episode highlights a letter from popular collections of the Schomburg. Through Web 2.0 technology, the podcast series activates the archive. The series stands at the creative intersections of audio, text, and photographs, providing listeners with a deeper understanding of the work and correspondence of our intellectual and artistic foremothers and forefathers, and directly from the people themselves, void of any interpretive text. In turn, listeners are, are able to engage black genius, creativity, ingenuity, and the personal lives of some of the 20th and 21st century's leading figures. Past episodes features have included Philippa Schuyler, Josephine Baker, Zona Hurston, Aaron Douglas, and Julia Mayfield. Adventure tales, strategic planning for political advocacy, and moments of frustration are candidly discussed within the correspondence, allowing our digital audience a peek inside of our virtual reading room. And the chance to see and hear some of the most important figures through a rarely seen or heard form of correspondence. Um, but in the letter, um, he waxes eloquently to his, his, um, his precious flower, how he's looked at the moonlight and the stars and how he's imagined her as their distance from each other in these sacred spaces. And he signs the letter, Daddy. Um, not quite, <laughs> exactly, and not quite what I was expecting when I was looking through his papers. Um, but like I said, a very intimate portrait of a, a very well renowned artist um, who we love and admire for his work, um, and who his wife admired clearly as well. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So um, the center engages the work of artists not only in our research collections, but in our public programming engagement process. All right. This 1986 poster displaying the work of iconic painter Jacob Lawrence was used to commemorate the legacy of Mr. Schomburg. Our collections, both digital paper and paper-based, are home to visionary sculptors such as Augusta Savage. These 1935 images of her acclaimed harp found at the Stephen A. Schwarzman building of the New York Public Library and also not to Augusta Savage's papers that are home at the Schomburg Center. Um, these magazine covers are found in her papers. They um, explore her exemplary work with harp and another later sculpture piece. Furthermore, our recently digitized WPA era collections illustrate the work of artists such as Morris Shulman, Bernard P. Chart, and Agnes Hart here. The letters and papers of artists such as Buford Delaney and collagist Romare Bearden allow contemporary artists and scholars and activists to view the lives of public figures, friends and fellow artists such as James Baldwin. Most recently, We've joined in the work being done by our colleagues at college and university libraries creating research guides with our series of online research guides. We are continuing in our legacy of preserving and making accessible materials related to the global black experience. Researchers who are typically remotely um, located are able to access materials from our five different divisions at the Schomburg Center. Um, the guides currently include subjects such as Marcus Garvey, Catherine Dunham, and Dr. Maya Angel, all pictured here. The work of rethinking, rethinking, reimagining, and reframing the archive under the aesthetic of cool continues today among popular contemporary black artists. Just last fall, 2016 Joyce Alexander Wine Artist Prize winner, New York-based multidisciplinary artist Derek Adams used the archive of 1980s iconic black fashion designer Patrick Kelly located at the Schomburg Center as a part of his Studio Museum of Harlem in Harlem Initiative. Uh, Adams's Patrick Kelly inspired piece will be on display at the County Cullen Library in Harlem within the coming months. This here is a letter um, from Dr. Maya Angelou to uh, while she was at Wake Forest, um, to an editor, she was working on a book about Patrick Kelly that was never used, um, but that's also found in the Schomburg Center um, papers for Patrick Kelly. So I'm actually going to leave you with a quick clip from our recently digitized Patrick Kelly um, collection. And like I said, the sound isn't playing, but just imagine you're kind of in a boomerang era, Jody Watley uh, sound <laughs> clip. That's what the music is in the background. So there's everybody here from Naomi Campbell to um, Beverly Johnson and all the rage there in Paris. This is uh, fall, winter 1989 fashion show. And with that, I've been given the sign to wrap up. And so I will stop. Thank you very much.